Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to continuing our series that we're looking at building relational bridges and today uh, we're going to be talking about anger and conflict and how that can actually strengthen your relationship and this is kind of a little counterintuitive because if you normally think hmm, anger that's probably not good conflict that's probably not good but they but it can be harmful obviously we've all felt that but it can be it can be something we can grow in but we all and the reason we need to talk about it is because we all struggle from time to time with this issue of anger, right? I mean, it just comes at us sometimes out of nowhere. Sometimes it's in us, sometimes it's coming at us. Uh, just a few months ago, Sharon and I were flying uh, into Philadelphia. We were, that we, that we were going through, that was uh, just kind of uh, a connecting flight for us. And when I get on the plane, evidently when I had my carry-on, you know, you, you've got to put it up in the bin, right? And you know, if you've, if you've flown, you know, the bins are like always packed. I get myself up there. Evidently, I moved some guy's luggage that I wasn't aware of. He evidently is stewing the whole time, just like so upset. So we get off and he hunts me down. I'm, we had just gotten off, Sharon. I just get off the plane. We're walking uh, to go get our next flight. This guy comes up to me. He is irate. I mean, and I don't even know why he's angry. He's, he's just, he's, you know, bulging out of his neck and, you know, out of his temples. And he's, his face is pounding. And he's just, you know, just ready to, like, like devour me or something. Just so angry. And I said, what in the world? What are you so upset about? You touched my luggage. I thought, and, and fortunately, some of the other people that were on the same flight, that were watching what was going down, they like stuck up for me. They didn't know me from anybody. They go, no, he didn't. They didn't really know if I touched his luggage. <laughs> but I appreciated it, you know. That's right. Listen to these people. They all watch. I didn't touch your luggage. <laughs> but that's how it gets. I mean, people just, sometimes you're on a hair trigger, right? Just something so small. What, and it, sometimes it only takes something. I was thinking about some of the small things that, that get me. You know, when I wash my car and then it rains later that day. That gets me upset. Another one is if I go into the shortest queue in the supermarket line, and it turns out to be the longest line, right? And it's not the shortest queue. Uh, I'm running to an elevator trying to get on, and as it's closing, there's people in it, but nobody pushes the open, and they're just, but they look at me like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, you, if you could have only run faster, it could have worked better for you. <laughs> Sometimes I'm at, uh, one of these like Mexican like Chipotle or uh, you know Cadoba where they're you know they make your burrito there and you have like a measured amount of meat and I'm like tithering should I get two scoops or I'll just get one and and then they only put one on I'm thinking I should have got two and then like a cube of beef rolls off and they don't put it back on and I'm like that's my I paid for that I'm hungry put the beef back on that irritates me it's so small, but I must have problems, right? <laughs> Sometimes I get caught up in a group chat that I didn't start, and it just goes on and on, and there's emojis, and I'm thinking, and my phone's blowing up, I'm trying to work, and I'm thinking, how did I get sucked into this group chat? <laughs> Does that irritate? So there's a lot of things that can get us, right? They just kind of get our go, they get us going. Those are small things, much less the big things. We have things that really, really get us to get upset and it can really cause us to uh fracture our relationships right i mean it really proverbs notice take out your outline if you would we're going to go through a couple verses 
the very top of your outline. You'll see there Proverbs 11.29. It says, The fool who provokes his family to anger and resentment will finally have nothing left. Now that certainly can happen. You just keep, you, you, you don't bridle the anger. You let that thing go. Those things that, that causes all kinds of damage. He says you can end up with nothing. And that's true not just in your family, but in your work, in your friendships, all kinds of relationships. You let anger go without curtailing it in some way, and you'll end up with a lot of problems. Now, if you look in the Bible for people that struggle with anger, it's everywhere, right? Especially in the Old Testament. You see, it's just everywhere. Uh, one notable example is this guy named Elijah. Elijah was, in this, in, in this particular story, he was a little older, and so he had lost, I guess, all of his hair or most of his hair. He was, he was pretty bald, right? And so he, he, some kids start making fun of him. He's walking through this town, not minding his own business, and these kids start laughing at him. Ha, 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 baldy. Look at him. He's bald. He gets so upset, and he has, you know, he's a prophet, and he has these uh, supernatural abilities. He, he, like, curses these kids out of his anger, and two bears come out of the woods and maul 42 of the kids. Now, it's, I know it's, a, see, anger, that was a problem, right? That's not a good way of using your anger. It's not like the Bible is saying, now be like Elijah in this. Look at this. No, it's, the Bible shows us people's foibles, their weaknesses, their, and, 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 and that's not his best moment, but it's still recorded for us. And you see, Jesus certainly got angry, but he controlled it. He got angry. Sometimes he, he, he confronted people. Sometimes he did not. Sometimes he avoided conflict. Sometimes he resolved conflict. All kinds of things. But we all have triggers. And generally, this is an oversimplification, but generally we fall into one of two camps when it comes to anger. We either explode or we implode, right? We just kind of stuff it up. And and we all know the exploders, they're pretty easy to see. They explode, they get all upset, they stomp out of a meeting, they, you know, they're, they're, sometimes they're passive aggressive, and, they're, and, the, and everything you say, they shoot down your idea, uh, they're, you know, they're sarcastic, they, they, sometimes they, you know, they, they yell, they threaten, all kinds of stuff with the exploders. And that can be very destructive, obviously. That's not, that's not a helpful way to do it. The other way, though, is to like implode, like stuff it down. But that's like, toxic, that's like burying toxic waste. It's still there. Sometimes we think, oh, well, that's actually better. At least I'm not hurting anybody. You're hurting yourself. And if you do that long enough and that's your coping method, it's only a matter of time until you start hurting others. Because that stuff starts seeping out, you know, and you go, yeah, well, at least I don't, you know... Throw, you know, throw shrapnel and kick puppies and no, but you're, you're hurting yourself and you're, you're going to hurt other people. So both of those are not really the way to handle it. They're not going to, certainly not going to strengthen your relationships with people. And so we want to talk about what are the ways? How do we really work through this in a way that's helpful, builds our relationships? Okay, well, let's look. If you want peace in your relationships, then Follow this peace plan, a little peace plan, and uh, it goes with that acronym PEACE. P stands for put up a mirror. And you, here's some questions you could ask. What is this about? Why am I angry? What is the trigger? What's triggering this in me? What tri is triggering this in them? Those are the kind of questions about, you know, putting up a mirror and asking those uh, soul-searching questions. Proverbs 13.10 says, pride leads to arguments. I mean, you can stop right there. That's a big part of what goes on in homes. It's pride that's going on. People, nobody wants to, to, take the, to, to, to take up humility. It's, and it's, about being, it's all about me. James 4 says, Do you know where your fights and arguments come from? Here's the answer. They come from the selfish desires that war within you. And so a big part of this element of addressing putting up the mirror doing some looking in with yourself is kind of realizing that anger is a secondary emotion there's something else going on and so you have to take a moment and say what's really going on inside of me what's the real emotion that's there now there's uh you were taught in grade school the primary colors right 
And those three primary colors kind of make up the color spectrum. Well, there's like three primary emotions and that, would be, that, that cause anger. That's hurt. And I think I've, I found something on the internet. I asked to put it up there. You have, you have hurt, you have fear, and you have frustration. Now, there's two other ones. And this, this one that I found on the internet, which is uh, you know, rejection and humiliation, which is a form of hurt, right? So if five works for you, that's fine. Three might be easier to remember. Hurt, fear, and frustration. But here, no, keep putting that back up, please. So, but what I wanted to point to is it's, it's like an iceberg. What often we see is the anger on the very top. But really what's carrying the iceberg is all of those emotions below it. And so that's, how do you be able to, how can you get below that? We, it's, you got to be self-introspective. No, you can take that off. So, so that's what I'm talking about, is, is what's really going on? Why are you getting angry? This past Monday, Sharon and I were, we decided to go by McDonald's near our house and get one of those little 59-cent cones. We thought, hey, let's go get a cone. You know, so we, we, we go by, because it's fast, it's easy, it's cheap, 59 cents. We pull around only to find out there are so many cars in the, in the uh, order to go thing. You know, I mean, the, it's, so we just thought, wow, look at it. I mean, there's just like, I don't know, 10 or 15 cars. It was wrapped around the whole restaurant. And then we looked in and we could see there's only one person in. Everybody was going through the, through the to-go order line. And we thought, oh, well, Sharon goes, I'll just run in and get it. I'll be right back. I said, that's a great idea. So I stay in the car. I kind of pull over a little bit. She goes over there. Five minutes goes by. 10 minutes. This is fast food, folks. For a cone, 10 minutes goes by. She's looking at me like through there, like real f- upset. And, and she, you know, we're pointing at our clocks. And, and I was watching the person I would have been behind if I had just gotten in. And that person goes, he's a, it's a truck. And he's, he's, he ends up leaving with a big smile on his face. Yeah, you know, he's got his food. I don't have mine. I'm starting to get upset. So finally, I parked the car. Get out of my car. Go in and go, Sharon, what in the world is going on here? She goes, I don't know. I'm really upset, though, because one person, and I still don't have my cone, and so I'm kind of, both of us, we're like looking, you know, standing there. We, at that moment, we don't mention, oh, we're pastors from Vineyard, you know. That's probably not the good time to say that. We kind of forget that, you know. We're just people, hungry people at that time. So we finally get our cones. We're pretty upset. We go, we're never going back there again. What kind of fast food is that? So really, what's going on with the anger? It's frustration, right? Frustration because we wanted our 59-cent cone at a, from a fast food restaurant quickly. Well, you can see I'm still processing my feelings, you know, <laughs> still, still working through that issue. But, and that's kind of, you know, that's somewhat harmless, right, a cone? We know when it comes to relationships, it's, it can be pretty, pretty painful sometimes. Some of the hurt, some of those hurts of rejection, humiliation, those are big deals. So, but taking a moment and saying, hey, what's going on here? Why am I so upset with the way my spouse is parenting our kids? And really, it's fear that, you know, that will end up alienating him from me or causing him to overreact and, and, and go in a bad direction or, or, or whatever it is. You know, I mean, there's, there's fears and most of us are filled with insecurities. We got to be willing to admit that and kind of own up to that if we're going to go in this area of peace, which is putting up the mirror. And e is examine your anger. Now there's a there's an emotional element. There certainly is a bio, biochemical element it's, it's, there's something physiological happening because God created anger in us. Anger is not a bad thing. It can be used for bad, but it also can be used for good. You know, a lot of times we're not really motivated to do what we need to do until we are angry enough, right? It's just, we got to just, we put up with it, put up with it. Finally, we, no, I'm not, I'm not taking this anymore. And we get angry. Of course, by then we often utilize our anger in inappropriate ways that are destructive, so I'm not saying we wait that long, but anger can be a motivator, can certainly help us. So by itself, anger is not necessarily wrong. You ask the question, like, where is this headed? In other words, is it worth really addressing? And, and, and then how I go about it, because there's three different types of, of pathways. One is a healthy anger, a healthy way to express it, a way that is, uh, is positive, is constructive. Jesus got angry once in John 2, we're told in John chapter 2, he comes into the temple, he sees that, um, which is kind of his church of his day, he sees that, uh, that 
there's all these people that have set up these money changing because the people were coming from all over different countries, different nationalities. They didn't have the right currency. And they were told, oh, the only way you can come in is if you pay money because you have to have an offering. And, and so they were keeping people that had traveled long distances to connect with God from even, from even being able to be there because they charged these exorbitant fees. So they didn't have enough money, and this causes chaos. That's going. So that's why Jesus is upset. He gets upset. He goes over. He actually puts together a whip right there. People are looking at him. What's that dude doing? He's putting a whip together. What's he doing with that whip? Next thing you know, he's cracking the whip. I don't know if you knew this. It's in most movies, they only show you the turning the tables over. And that's really cool. But if you're reading John, he makes a whip, and he goes to town, man. He's whipping and snapping, and, and then he starts throwing the, 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 the tables around. Money's going everywhere. Everyone's, and that's his, one of his more famous incidences of, of being angry. But it's an appropriate anger. People were being kept from God. And so that's helpful, but it's not always helpful. Sometimes our anger becomes hurtful. It hurts people. Uh, we, and sometimes we care. Sometimes we don't care. Sometimes it's intentional. Sometimes it's not. And... Uh, and so if, if you want a good example of it being hurtful in the Bible is with Samson. Samson, real strong guy in the Old Testament. He's, um, he gets married and, and then he finds out that his wife, he actually shows up and she's actually in bed with another guy. He totally loses it. He gets so angry. He decides to take it out on the Philistines because he married a Philistine and and the, his in-laws are Philistines. So he just like says, I'm a, he's just angry at the, at, at the whole nationality. So he goes. And now when we're upset, when we're really angry, we can be pretty creative, especially if we're thinking revenge things. How can I get them back, right? I mean, there's lots of great movies on revenge, right? How can I get so-and-so back? I'm going to get them back in the most creative way. Well, this is what he does. He goes and he finds 300 foxes. That's a lot. Could you imagine? They must have a fox problem back then. You know, I mean, 300 foxes ties them together two by two with their tails. So now there's 150 pairs and then ties with twine or whatever used and then tied a torch to each one. And then he lights the torch. So they have these foxes have this torch, you know, they're like freaking out. So they like and then he sets them loose because it was around harvest time, sets them loose in the fields, in the vineyards, in the barley fields, all kinds of fields, burning up their crops. And then, of course, they're all upset. And he says, well, that's what you get. Don't do that again. I mean, that's, so it's hurtful anger, right? So that's, not, that's not the most appropriate way to do it. Then it, that can actually, do, actually descend further down to hateful anger, where it just turns ugly. An example of that in the Old Testament, again, is this Saul... Uh, he finds out that a priest, Ahimelech, uh, had helped David. And at this time, he's just upset at David. No real reason. David's not a threat. David uh, is very respectful to him, honors him. But Saul's like got, he's incensed with anger. He just can't control it. So uh, he finds out Ahimelech helps him by giving him, David and some of his men, some, some, some bread. Uh, he gives David a sword. It's actually the sword. It's actually David's sword. It's, it's Goliath's old sword, and David's the one who slew Goliath. He goes, here's your sword back, and helps him, gives him a little advice. Saul freaks out in his anger. It's hateful. He's just enraged, ends up having Ahimelech killed. Of all the other priests, and they're killed. All of Ahimelech's relatives are killed and slaughtered. All their family pets and their cattle. And every, I mean, he just totally rages out. So, Certainly there's movies about that. And you don't have to just watch the movies to find that stuff. You can find it on the news and all over, right? That's anger kind of, it doesn't, it's, it can be helpful. It can be hurtful and it can certainly be hateful. Ephesians 4 says, and don't let, and don't sin by letting anger gain control of you. So anger can become sin. It doesn't have to be, but it can be if it gains control of you. A is act slowly. Now this is where we get into trouble because we act impulsively. You ask the questions, what's, what's the question? What will, what, what will be accomplished? What will be accomplished? Now, words are very powerful, and, uh, and, and, and they can hurt. They hurt. I mean, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Whoever came up with that is an idiot because the truth is I'd much rather have you hit me with a stick 
Because a stick, you know, that leaves a bruise, the bruise will heal. Words, they last sometimes for a lifetime. And so words can be very, very painful. And we let the words get the best of us sometimes. I mean, they just start, they just come out. And then we think, ah, I probably shouldn't have said that. Actually, a lot of times we, we're in the middle of saying it. We realize I shouldn't be saying this, but here it goes. And it's just, it's just coming out. It's just like we don't have control. Sharon and I, especially early in our marriage, we've been married 30 years, but the first like 10, 15 years, we would like, if I was like saying something, and I realized I probably shouldn't say this, and I would stop, she would say, well, what were you going to say? And I would do the same thing. She'd say something, and, and, and she knew she shouldn't be saying it, and she'd stop, and I'd go, well, you might as well finish it. You're halfway through now. <laughs> We've discovered that's not a profitable way to carry on a conversation. <laughs> We now let it go. You know, if right in the middle, I can be saying something, I just stop. And we didn't even have to, at first, we'd say, were you, uh, is that something that's better not? So, yep, yep. Now we just know. We just kind of look. Yeah, it was a dumb idea, wasn't it? <laughs> You're learning after 30 years. I'm passing on. Some stuff took me years and years to figure out. I'm a slow learner. I, you know, if you take an exercise and you, you go take a piece of wood, you go grab a hammer and a nail, and you smack, put that, ha- that nail in, in the, ha- uh, the uh, nail into the wood, and that's like every, you know, angry word you say, you can go back and apologize, right? And you just take that nail out, but the hole is still there. And that's a lot like words. So th- they go in, yeah, they can come out, but there's a hole. There's some damage done. And so we need to be careful that we don't, that we don't do that. Proverbs 13, 16 says, wise people think before they act. Now, think is a key word. Circle that. Think, because think gives you time, and time is your friend. It gives you a chance to contemplate, to think, to act slowly. Fools don't, and they even brag about it. See, consider their condition. In other words, you want to look beyond, beneath the surface, like we talked about with the, um, with the, the iceberg, right? Beneath. But now it's not you, it's them. You're thinking about the person, the other person. What are they going through? What's their situation? Sharon's particularly good at this. But, you know, thinking, hey, how, how are they doing? What's, what's going on in their, in their life circumstances? Because that certainly can cause anger, because where does anger come from? Well, it comes from fear. It comes from frustration. It comes from from hurt. And those three things, those three emotions can come from very good things. I mean, you can move to a new home. Wee, that's great. You know, you, you, you get a new car, you get married, you, 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 uh, you graduate college, your kids go off to college. There's all kinds of things. Uh, you bring a home, you bring a child home, a brand new baby, all kinds. But could, uh, could those things cause fear? Any of those? Yeah, right? I might lose my job. That's a great job I have. Uh, something might happen to my kid. I might not be a good parent. I mean, just, uh, you could go on and on with each one of them. What if the marriage doesn't last? What if it doesn't? What if I, what if this happens? What if, what if, what if, you know, fear, insecurity, the frustrations that go with those things, and sometimes hurt, real, real hurt. And those things are real. So even in positive things, it can cause anger. Now, anger is not always explosive. Remember, we talked about that. Sometimes it's internal. So, you know, something good happens, well, you know, no, but inside, see, it's going, it's, something's going on. A great example is our church plant. We're launching this church. Now, this is exciting. I love doing church plants. It is kind of like a birth, in a way. Giving birth, I'm doing something great. We're seeing new life. We're going to be expanding what we're doing in, 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 in Virginia. But could it cost, could, it, could there be some fear that goes with that? Well, with Jacob around, uh, not around anymore, uh, you, know, who, who, you know, who do I talk to? He was, so, he was such a good listener. You know, uh, who's going to preach like him? Who's going to lead like him? What about Aaron? What about, you know, Kingsley? I mean, how can I go without seeing Kingsley every day and, you know, or every week? You know, I mean, just those things can be. And then some of the core team that already left and went up there. Now, there's a reshuffling with our staff. That's part of the growth. Like anything, whenever something new happens, even positive, there's going to be kind of some reshuffling and figuring things out. Some things maybe we can't do that. That was based around somebody's gift mix. And now, but somebody else, God's raising up somebody else, their gift mix looks a little different. So that's going to look different. Those things can cause frustration. They can cause hurt. They can cause fear. 
It can cause anger. It's, and it can get in the way of our relationships if we're not aware of it. That's why we need to be ruthless about introspection, looking at ourselves. Hey, what's going on? Be slow about it. Consider other people. What, you know, what are, where, where are they at? What's going on with them? Examine ourselves, all those things, okay? So those are important. It says, don't be selfish. Don't only think about your own affairs, but be interested in others too. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. And then E, embrace God's plan for peace. Embrace, embrace God's plan for peace. Now, the first is to pray. Prayer is important. A lot of times we go to people first about people instead of God first about people. Jesus says, hey, we should be going to uh, go to God first. Then when you confront somebody, go to them. James 1.5 says, if you need wisdom and you want to know what God wants you to do, ask who? Ask God, right? Ask him, and he will gladly tell you. He will not resent you asking. So it's always the best thing to do uh, to ask God. And the reason is, is, hey, listen, conflict is good or can't, and, and certainly is, is, is very helpful sometimes, but it's complicated, and almost every time when I look back in hindsight, I could have done it better. I could have done it better. I've never done it perfectly. And all the ones I've been in, resolution meetings, they've never gone perfectly. So we need God's wisdom going into it. What's the best time? What, how, what's the best way to do it? Next is apologize. A big part of this. You want ammunition? You're gathering up ammunition? Here's some ammunition to help and not be destructible, but be helpful. Double barrel shotgun is, is I'm sorry. I'm wrong. Right? Very important. Those can be very disarming in a relationship. Very helpful. And they're hard to say a lot of times. Now, let me just say as a side that if somebody says that to you, I'm sorry, I was wrong, that is not the time to say, what'd you say? Let me hear that again. Because they've mustered up the, you know, all that they need to do to, to say, hey, I'm, I'm, this is an olive leaf. I'm trying to make this thing better. <clears throat> You might be going, Andy, you're making too big of a deal about that. I'm a teaser. I do that stuff. No, no, there's some truth in that. That's teasing is an escape goat. Teasing is a, whenever we're kind of caught in the act of doing something we shouldn't be doing. So many of us go, oh, we're just teasing. And it's like a weasel, weasel claws. Yeah, I was a jerk, but I'm not going to admit it. So, 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 don't, so don't, don't tease like that. That's not the appropriate time. A pro, Proverbs 28 says, anyone who refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful. But if he confesses and forsakes them, he gets another chance. Then confront. Now, sometimes when we talk about confrontation, exploders think, oh, man, I'm so good at this. Well, no, not necessarily. You might actually be worse. Because confrontation is not all about exploding. It's a, there's some finesse that goes into it. There's some listening. There's some, you know, considering other people's feelings, where they're coming from. There's that great, great verse there in Matthew. He says, hey, it, it, when it comes to confrontation, if you realize you're at ought with somebody and you're at church and you're about to give an offering, Jesus says, D don't even waste your time. Don't even give that offering. You just get up, take your offering with you, go get it right because it's not going to mean anything. It's not going anywhere because you have a problem with somebody. Now, Jesus said that, right? So, you know, so when the, we pass the offering at the end of the service, if I see some of you guys go, I know what's going on. No problem. <laughs> you guys are b be blessed, okay? No problem with me. So confrontation. It can be scary, no doubt about it. Here's another one. Forgive. Forgiveness is just so important because it, it is the lubrication in a, in a, in, in a, in a uh, marriage, in a relationship, any relationship, but particularly in a marriage, if you're going to be married to somebody for a long time, just because, now I love the fact when people say, hey, I've been married for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, Sharon and I have been married 30 years, but it can be 30 years or 40 years or 50 years of misery. Doesn't mean it's, and everybody says, like, oh yeah, you've been miserable 50 years, I'm, well, yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> What's up with that? So, so it's not just quantity, it's quality. I think we all w want that, right? We're all wanting that. It's not, who wants to be miserable for year after year after year? Listen, forgiveness is so important in this element of having restoration, a good relationship with somebody. Now, I am talking about marriage, but I'm also talking about work relationships and friendships, girlfriend, boyfriend. Forgiveness is, is vital. And here's the good news is you'll never have to forgive somebody more than God has forgiven you. This is, this, is, this is true. You say, well, wait a minute. 
Well, it just means you don't realize the stench of your own sin if you, if you don't think that's true. See, God is holy and perfect. We're not. When we sin, he forgave us. And that's the message of the gospel. It says, remember, the Lord forgave you, and you must forgive others. And then this verse here, I really didn't want to put it in because I like, I like to be the nice guy, but, you know, I mean, um, that's not my job. When I, you know, when I get up here, I've got to tell you what God says. Here's, wh- here's what he says. He says, if you refuse, Jesus said, if you for- refuse to give others, your Father will not forgive your sins. So he says, hey, it's kind of serious, actually. You need to do something about this, okay? And then reconcile with God. Reconciling with God is important. It is recognizing that I have offended him, that he's perfect. Now, reconciliation means that you're realizing that there's a brokenness in the friendship. There's a brokenness in your connection with somebody. And some of you recognize on your end you're not reconciled with God. You are upset at God. You have a case against him. And you need to reconcile on that level. You need to say, God, I, I've been holding this thing against you. The way this, I feel like a victim. I feel like I got a raw deal in this deal. And, and, and that's all part of reconciling to God. But another part of it, is sometimes I talk to people, they go, well, I don't have a problem with God. Well, that's, that's on your end only. You haven't recognized that God might have a problem with you. That your sin has caused a division where he, he's holy. He can't, he can't be around that. And yet he provided a way because he loves you, because he cares about you. He provided a way through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came, lived a perfect life, went to the cross, died on the cross, and on the cross talked about forgiveness and that he was there for sin, the dying of the sins of the world. That means our sins. And so when we put our faith in Christ, that's when that reconciliation happens. All of a sudden, we're at peace with God. And the truth is, you can't be at peace with people, really, until you're at peace with God. There'll always be that undercurrent of anxiety, of angst, of broken relationship, of lack of understanding, forgiveness, not being able to give it, lack of receiving unconditional love, not being able to give it. I mean, there's always that, that lack of peace in your relationships until you're at peace with God. But that changes everything when you put your faith in Christ. Notice with me, and we'll close with this verse. If you do this, you will experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. See, our deep-rooted fears and our frustrations, those things that just gnaw at us all the time, the hurts, things that we've just received from other people and pain we've experienced in life. This is what God wants to deal with. He says, I want to come and bring peace to your soul. It's really a good deal. That's why Jesus calls it the good news. He didn't come with the bad news. Hey, I got sucky news for you guys. No, he said, hey, I got great news. Great news to tell you that, but it does take this, there's something that on our end, right? Free will. God gives us the choice to reject him and say, I'll do it on my own. I'm, I, I don't need you. Or, yeah, I, I, I do need that. And that's the moment of truth when we recognize that I need Christ. I need to be at peace with God because that will transform my relationships. Okay, let's bow our heads and pray. Right now, I'm going to invite you to just pray a prayer There's nothing magical about a prayer, but a prayer of faith does have the power to change your circumstances. And you put your faith in Christ. And so today, right now, I'm going to invite you just right where you're at. You just whisper. Don't worry about the person next to you and what they're thinking or what they're they're doing. doesn't matter. What matters is you. That's all you can control anyways. Right now, you have an opportunity to change some things in your life. To make things better. To make your future brighter. To invite God's hand, his divine presence into your life, into what you're doing, into your plans, into your aspirations, into your goals, into your relationships. And I'm going to ask you to pray and do that right now. Say, God, right now, I need you in those spaces in my life. Would you do that? Just say, God, come 
into those places in my life. I give you, would you give God, say, God, I give you permission to help bring calmness and peace to those things that I fear? You say, God, I give you permission to bring peace to things that frustrate me? And then say, God, I give you permission to bring healing to those places where I hurt, where I've lost hope. where they're just so painful, I really don't want to really think about them even. You say, God, I want your peace in my heart. And so your word says that it comes through Christ. And so right now, would you say, Jesus Christ, I'm going to put my faith in you. Not in the church, not in other Christians, in you. Today, I choose to follow you. And would you lift up maybe that sensitive relationship that's going on? Say, God, help me to see your hand of favor in my marriage or in my relationship with my boyfriend or girlfriend or with my parent, with that friend, with a, somebody at work. Just say, God, right now, Lord, help me to follow this peace plan. I need to looking within myself, really examine what's going on. Help me to see what other people are, where they're, what's going on in their lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.